Hello Krishna dear devotees, please join us today in the study of Srimad Bhagavatam. Today we are starting a new canto, canto 11. Today we will be studying canto 11, chapter 1, the curse upon the Yadu dynasty. Hare Krishna.
please join us for Madhavachan prayers. We'll say it together. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Narayam Namaskritya Naram Chevanarotamam Devim Saraswatim Vyasam Tato Jayam Mudirye Shamatam Swa Katha Krishna Punya Shamana Kirtanaha Hridayam Tasto Hya Bhadrani Vidunoti Suhasatam Nashta Prayeshwa Bhadreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttam Shloke Bhakti Bhakti Nashtiki Hare Krishna, please join us in the recitation of the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam. Canto 11, Chapter 1, The Curse Upon the Yadu Dynasty. Shri Shukha Uvacha Shri Shukha Uvacha Kritva Dhyatya Vadham Krishna Kritva Dhyatya Vadham Krishna Saramo Yadu Bhirvrata Saramo Yadu Bhirvrata Bhuvo Avtar Yad Bharam Javishtam Janayan Kalim Javishtam Janayan Kalim Please Shri Shukha Uvacha Kritva Dhyatya Vadham Krishna Kritva Dhyatya Vadham Krishna Saramo Yadu Bhivrata Saramo Yadu Bhivrata Bhuvavtar Yad Bharam Javishtam Janayan Kalim Shri Shukha Uvacha Shri Shukha Uvacha Shri Shukha Dev Goswami said Shri Shukha Dev Goswami said Kritva Kritva Having performed Having performed Daitya Daitya Of the demons Of the demons Vadham Vadham The killing The killing Krishna Krishna Lord Krishna Lord Krishna Sir Ramaha Sir Rama Accompanied by Balram Accompanied by Balram Yadu Bhi Yadu Bhi By the Yadus By the Yadus Vrtaha Vrta Surrounded Surrounded Bhuvaha Bhuva Of the earth Of the earth Avtariyat Avtariyat Cause to be lessened Cause to be lessened Bharam Bharam The burden The burden Javishtam Javishtam most sudden leading to violence. Most sudden leading to violence. Janiyan. Janiyan. Raising. Raising. Kalim. Kalim. A state of quarrel. A state of quarrel. Translation by the disciples of His Divine Grace, Sri Bhakti Vedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada. Sri Shukde Goswami said, Lord Krishna, accompanied by Balram and surrounded by the Yadu dynasty, executed the killing of many demons. Then further to remove the burden of the earth, the Lord arranged for the great battle of Kurukshetra, which suddenly erupted in violence between the Kurus and the Pandavas. Purport. The 11th canto of Shiva Bhagavatam begins with a reference to the pastimes executed by Lord Shri Krishna in the 10th canto. The beginning of the 10th canto describes that when the earth was overburdened by demonic rulers, the personified earth Bhumi approached Lord Brahma with tears in her eyes, begging for relief, and Brahma immediately went with the demigods to approach the Supreme Lord in his form of Shirodakshai Vishnu, as the demigods waited respectfully on the shore of the milk ocean. The Supreme Lord announced through Brahma that he would soon incarnate on earth and that the demigods should also descend to assist in his pastimes. Thus, from the very beginning of Lord Krishna's appearance, it was understood that he would descend on earth to remove the demons. As Srila Prabhupada states in his commentary to Bhagavad Gita 16.6, those who agree to obey the injunctions of revealed scriptures are known as demigods, whereas those who defy the orders of Vedic scriptures are known as asuras or demons. The Vedic literatures are presented within the universe for the guidance of the conditioned souls who are trapped under the three modes of material nature and who are therefore 
rotating in a continuous cycle of birth and death. By strictly adhering to the Vedic injunctions, we can easily satisfy our material needs and at the same time make tangible progress on the path back home and in the Lord's own abode simply by obeying the Lord's instructions as they are presented in Vedic literatures such as Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. The demons, however, minimize or even mock the absolute authority of the Supreme Lord and His teachings. Because these Asuras envy the sovereign status of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they minimize the importance of the Vedic scriptures, which emanate directly from the breathing of the Lord. The demons establish a society governed by their own concocted whims and inevitably create chaos and misery, especially for pious living entities who sincerely desire to follow the will of God. Lord Shri Krishna states in Bhagavad Gita that when there is predominance of such chaotic, irreligious societies on the earth, he personally descends to rectify the imbalance. Thus, from the very beginning of his transcendental infancy, Krishna systematically killed the powerful Asuras or demons who were an intolerable burden on earth. Lord Shri Krishna was assisted by his brother Balram, who is also the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Although God is one, he can expand himself to enjoy in many forms at once. That is his omnipotence. And the first such expansion is Balram or Baldev. Balram killed many noteworthy demons, including Renukasura, Vivida, and envious Rukmi. Krishna was also accompanied by the members of the Yadu dynasty, many of whom were demigods who had descended to assist the Lord. Srila Bhakti Siddhan Saraswati Thakur, however, has revealed that although many demigods had taken birth in the Yadu dynasty to assist the Lord, some members of the Yadu dynasty were actually inimical toward Krishna. Because of their mundane vision of the Lord, they considered themselves to be on the same level as Krishna. Having taken birth in the family of the Supreme Personality of Godhead Himself, they had inconceivable strength and thus they misunderstood Krishna's superior po supreme position. Having forgotten that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they would constitute a great burden and consequently it was necessary for Krishna to remove them from the earth. There is a popular saying that familiarity breeds contempt. To destroy the contemptuous members of his own dynasty, the Lord caused a quarrel among them. For this purpose, he arranged for Narada and other sages to display anger against the Kashanas, the members of his family. Although many Yadus who were devoted to Krishna were apparently killed in this patricidal war, Lord Krishna actually returned them to their original position as universal directors or demigods. It is the Lord's promise in Bhagavad Gita that he will always protect those who are favorable to his service. Sri Lavishwanath Chakrati Thakur, in his commentary on this verse, has given a summary of the entire 11th canto as follows. Chapter 1 describes the beginning of the Marshal Leela, or the prelude to the destruction of the Yadu dynasty. Chapters 2 through 5 describe their conversations between the nine Yogendras and King Nimi. Chapter 6 describes the prayers of Brahma, Shiva and other residents of heaven. Chapter 7 through 29 present the conversation between Krishna and Uddhav, that is known as the Uddhav Gita. Chapter 30 describes the withdrawal of the Yadu dynasty from the earth. The final chapter describes the disappearance of Lord Krishna. Hare Krishna. Please join us for Guru Pranati. Namo Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine. 
नमस्ते सारस्वते देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेषा शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देशतारिणे ओम ज्ञान तिमृंद ज्ञानंजन शलाखय चक्षुन्मील ये नस्म श्री गुरव नम मुखम करोती वाचाल पंगुम लंघयते गिरी यत्पा तदहम वंदे श्री गुरु दीन तारण हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 रामा हरे रामा राम रामा हरे 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 कृष्णा सो दिस इज अ ब्यूटीफुल चैप्टर एंड Lord Krishna actually reveals in Bhagavad Gita that one who understands the secret, the truth about his appearance and his activities, does not take birth in this material world again. So there is an amazing blessing. Yes. Janma karma chame devyam. So janma is appearance and karma is activities. Right, and that was Lord does not discuss about the disappearance here in this chapter. However, we will discuss about his disappearance. Yet at the same time, this uh, this is where we take shelter of acharyas, right? Anushilanam, and in the disciplic succession, acharyas they reveal the truth to us. That's what Lord Krishna is saying. Tatvata, one who knows the secret behind his. appearance and behind his past times so again his disappearance is also his leela so we have to identify that all the loving past time loving exchanges with his devotees all the miscreants with and i related by the lordship and and his devotees who he empower like arjun he empower arjun to kill so many demons and warriors at kurukshetra at the battle of kurukshetra and similarly now he arranges for the yadu dynasty to be cursed and what is the secret behind it that's what we'll discuss there are amazing lessons from this chapter and who is cursing this is also very important for us to understand that how did they get cursed so the yadu dynasty was cursed by the brahmanas and why were they cursed that is the past time we'll be covering today So in this chapter, in in Krishna book, uh, Shila Prabhupada in the last chapter he, you know, covers like how Lord Krishna he used, he invoked all his potencies as well as his devotees in delivering the burden of the earth. And with the eleventh canto, there are some amazing aspects are given. So it is very important to just quickly see what eleventh canto contains. And Shila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur gives a very nice summary of what 11th canto consists of so in the first chapter it is the beginning of the martial leela or the prelude of the destruction of yadu dynasty so yadu dynasty is going to get cursed and that's been covered in the first chapter and then in the second chapter through fifth chapter describes the conversation between the nine navyogendras nine yogendras and who are this navyogendras we'll be looking at in detail but these are you know the brothers the younger brothers of bharat maharaj and this navyogendras are giving instructions to king nimi so that past time is going to be in those four chapters 2 3 4 5 5 and then sixth chapter describes the prayers of the demigods and of lord brahma and lord shiva so lord brahma and lord shiva come and they all pray to lord krishna because they know that lord krishna's past time is ending his wonderful you know sweet past times on this earth is ending so he'll be going back so before he leaves back for his abode you know they come and they offer prayers and it is where chapter 7 through 29 is where lord krishna gives instructions to uddhav and this particular section 7 through 29 is called also known as uddhav gita so bhagavad gita spoken to arjun but this gita is lord krishna is speaking to uddhav and this is at a much exalted level right so again it is 
meant for the Paramhamsas because this is a message that Lord Krishna is passing on to Uddhav that he has to carry to Badrika Ashram. So beautiful pastimes are covered there in Uddhav Gita. And then chapter 30 describes the withdrawal of the Yadu dynasty as how all the members of Yadu dynasty, especially the, you know, very powerful Yadavas, they were, you know, able to go to their next destination. Why do I say next destination? Because Lord Krishna arranges his pastime in such a manner that whatever is the thought of a person who is hearing them, they feel satisfied. So one who is not a devotee of Krishna, they say, oh, he was just a common man. And see how everything happened and he couldn't do anything. Yet at the same time, devotees, we realize that Lord is so amazing in his pastimes that he is carrying out his pastimes in such a loving manner. And he is providing destination based on where those personalities are supposed to be going. So before going to his own abode, he makes sure that his eternal associates, they go with him. And when Lord appears, all his planetary portions and portions of his planetary portions, they all appear with him. So again, when Lord Krishna appears, Vasudeva appears, Shiro Dakshai Vishnu appears, all the other personalities, all the other Vishnu Tattvas, they appear with him. And also his eternal associates, they appear. And then when he leaves, would he just leave alone? No. When a king comes, he comes with the whole procession. And when the king leaves, he leaves with the whole procession. And the supreme king of this material and spiritual worlds, universes, is none other than Lord Krishna. So when he comes, he comes in a grand style. When he leaves, he leaves in a grand style. Yet at the same time, he has been compared with sun, right? Srila Prabhupada says in Krishna book that it is very appropriate that Lord Krishna is you know, compared as sun. Krishna, Surya, Sama, Maya, here and the Kara, Jaha Krishna, Taha, Nahi, Maya, Radhikara. So, Lord Krishna is like sun, and that is just appropriate. We talked about 108 analogies that can be derived just from this verse, Krishna, Surya, Sama. So, we'll be covering twice, two of them in this particular class. We have covered many others in the previous class, and we'll continue to cover others in the next few classes. So here, Lord Krishna is appearing in this material world. That is like appearance of sun. So it, just like sun appears to be rising and then it sets. That is for us, you know, people who are on earth, we realize that sun is rising and sun is setting. Yet at the same time, sun is already present at its position. It is not the sun that's rising and setting, it is earth that's revolving around the rotating around the sun, revolving on its axis. So because of the revolution on its axis, earth on earth we see sun rising and setting. But sun is already very nicely situated. Similarly, Lord Krishna is already situated at his supreme abode. He is present in Goloka. And then his first expansion is Lord Balaam. He is also present there in the spiritual world. Further expansion from Lord Balaam is Vasudev, Sankarshan, Pradyumna and Aniruddha, these four personalities. And these four personalities are responsible for managing the material universes. They are also present in the spiritual universe. But just like when the sun becomes visible to us, Lord manifests himself simultaneously. You know, he is in his spiritual world and he makes that spiritual world visible on earth. So Vrindavan Golok Vrindavan is manifested on earth. And Lord performs his Vrindavan Leelas. Then Lord moves to Mathura. And who goes to Mathura? We talked about this. Vasudev Krishna goes to Mathura. While Krishna in Aparakrit, in unmanifested form, he is not visible to everyone's, anyone's eyes. Rather, he is residing in their hearts, you know, not visible to them. He is still residing in Vrindavan. And we talked about this. Acharya has explained that Krishna never steps out of Vrindavan. Why? Because of the love of his devotees. He is bound by the love of Yashoda Mai. He is bound by the love of Nanda Baba. He is bound by the love of the elderly gopis who 
you know, want to serve him with such nice butter, yogurt, and so many nice offerings. He's bound by the love of the gopis, and especially Radha Rani. Radha Rani's name, Shukdev Goswami never speaks. He always says, that gopi, right? So when we covered the gopi Gita uh, chapters, he's referring to her. And when Uddha visits Vrindavan, she has been referred. But she, her name doesn't appear. And that is, again, because it's secret, because, you know, Lord wants these secrets to be revealed to his devotees. So we are so fortunate that we come to know of these facts. So just like Lord, and he's inconceivable, right? So he is amazing that he is there in the spiritual world, yet he makes that spiritual world appear in this material world. Just like Shvetadeep, that's where in the first chapter of Canto 10, Lord Brahma, after Mother Earth appears to him in the form of a cow crying that there are so many demonic kings on planet Earth. These are actually demons who are ruling and she cannot carry the burden of these demons. So Lord Brahma along with the other demigods, they go to Shir Sagar. Shir Sagar is ocean of milk and they are praying. So Lord Brahma, he prays from his heart and Lord Vishnu. Shiro Dakshai Vishnu. In Shri Saga, you have Shiro Dakshai Vishnu, who is also the super soul. He expands as super soul and he is in our heart as well as Paramatma, super soul. So he reveals that I will appear. So when he appears, he appears along with Vasudev, Sankarshan, Pradyumna, Nerud, and Lord Krishna, the original supreme personality of Godhead. And Lord Krishna's past times are manifesting in Vrindavan and afterwards. You know, as is shown that Akrura takes him to Mathura. So Vasudev and Sankarshan, their pastimes are manifesting in Mathura. And after Jarasan's 18th war, they run away, right? It's shown. And he is also called Ranchur. And we enjoy those pastimes. Then these pastimes are carried out in Dwarka. And this is in Dwarka where we catch up, where Lord Krishna. He is making an arrangement and there are three specific aspects. So first lesson we learn is that Lord, he, Lord Krishna is always having this loving exchange with his devotees. He never kills any demon. It is Vasudev in Krishna. It is Shirodaksha in Krishna. It's the Vishnu in Krishna who is killing all the demons and relieving the burden of this earth. And who's the personality who has taken up this task? Vasudev in Dwaraka. He is the one who is appearing with this mindset that I have to relieve the burden of this earth. And he is engaging Lord Balaam. So Lord Balaam also kills many demons. Dhenukasura, Pralambasura, even Rukmini's brother Rukmi was killed by him. And Duvida Gorilla, he was also killed by Lord Balaam. And similarly, the Yadavas, the army of the Yadus, with the army of Yadus, Lord Krishna killed many demons. Shalva was killed when he attacked Dwarka. Lord Krishna killed the false Vasudev, Pondraka, and so many other personalities. So Lord is continuing from his childhood itself is shown in Dwarka, in Vrindavan Leela, Lord Krishna is killing Putana, he is killing Shakta, so he is killing so many other demons, right? Vratrasur and Vyomasur and Keshi demon, Arishtasu, and the list goes on. And when he comes to Mathura, he kills the first the washerman, and then he kills Kansa along with uh, the wrestlers, Charun, and then Mushtika and his brothers are killed by Lord Balaam. So Lord is relieving the earth of the burden. So this is the burden of demoniac kings. And who's a demon that has been described by Srila Prabhupada very nicely? That one who does not follow the injunctions of the Shastra, who acts whimsically, speculatively, and does not follow the prescribed duties. And prescribed duties are also to be followed, dovetailing towards Krishna. So for the pleasure of Lord Krishna. So whatever we do, we should make sure that we are making it as an offering to Lord Krishna. Whatever we do, whatever we offer, whatever sacrifices we perform, whatever charity we perform, whatever we give away, all our activities, whatever we engage in on a daily basis, 
should be dovetailed to please Lord Krishna. Now, sometimes people say, I have to go to work. How could I make that happen? Well, Arjun, he was a warrior at the Battle of Kurukshetra. And there he was fighting with all these kings. And he had to employ his skill in fighting and his anger. Yet at the same time, Lord Krishna says, remembering me, you should fight, stand and fight. So in Bhagavad Gita, it is revealed very nicely. So Arjun, that's what he did. And now here, in this particular chapter, Lord is using this opportunity where the Yadu dynasty is cursed. But Shukde Goswami is not discussing there was a curse that happened before, which was the curse given by Gandhari, right? Right after the battle of Kurukshetra, when Gandhari came to know how her sons were being killed, she knew who's after it all this. She knew that it is Krishna. So she curses Krishna that just like I have lost all my sons, you will lose your dynasty. And Lord Krishna, he accepts it as it is. Right? So Lord Krishna is Bhav Gahi Janardana. For his devotees, he is looking at the essence, but for all living entities, he's looking at the essence. And he very nicely, he is never disturbed. He's Atmaram. He is very self-satisfied. So when she curses him, she agrees. Okay, so be it. He actually grants it. Just like when Ratnamala, the younger sister of Bani Maharaj, when she saw Vamandev, Vamandev is looking so beautiful, you know, just, you know, he, and Vamandev means midget, so he has this short form. He's just like a young Brahmachari with, uh, you know, his uh, Brahmachari dress, kusha belt, carrying an umbrella and a kamandula. He was looking so beautiful. She immediately wishes, oh, he's so beautiful. I wish he was my son, right? I wish I could feed him milk. I could nurse him. When she prays that, you know, in her mind, Lord grants it, Lord Vamandev. And when Lord Vamandev takes the three Vikrama form and asks for the three, you know, taking the three steps. First step, he covers the whole of earth. Second step, he has taken away the whole universe from Bali Maharaj. And then, then he is asking that you gave me that you will grant me charity of three steps. Where do I put my third step? At that time, all the demons, they were outraged. They were ready to attack. Yet at the same time, Bali Maharaj signaled them not to do that. And then he told Lord Vamandev in this Trivikrama form, this gigantic form, that my body is still mine. So please place your third step on my head. And Lord Vamandev, when he places that, all the demigods, they appear and they put Bali Maharaj in shackles. And here, Lord is actually glorifying Bali Maharaj. His tolerance, that's what has been glorified. Bali Maharaj was in majority. We talked about this yesterday. That when someone is in majority, yet at the same time, they are ready to bear great pain. That is tolerance. When you, when you are in minority and then you are you know going through pain and you are trying to rise, that's courage. That's not tolerance. So there is very subtle dis, dis, difference between the two. We should understand that. So Bali Maharaj is glorified in that past time so much so that Vamandev says that you have bought me. You know you have just purchased me with your love, and he goes with Bali Maharaj at Sutala Planet. He becomes the gatekeeper of Bali Maharaj. And Goddess Lakshmi is wondering where Vishnu has gone. <laughs> right? She is like, in Vakunta there is, there is Lord Vishnu when she comes back. So she has to, now we talked about how she goes to Sutala planet, saying that I am looking for my husband, I don't know where he has gone. And she takes shelter of Bali Maharaj. And there, she is the first one who ties Rakhi. So the first Raksha Bandhan was performed where Goddess of Fortune, Lakshmi Devi, she ties that Rakhi on the hands of Bali Maharaj and prays for his long life, prays for him to be always glorious, be always magnanimous. And Bali Maharaj, he says, Oh, my dear sister, what should I give to you? And what does she say? Please return my husband. You know? So it's, it's, it's a very loving pastime where Bali Maharaj, then he realizes, Oh, this is Goddess of Fortune. First, Lord appeared as Vamandev and he cheated me. This time, 
when Lord is here and I get to pray, worship him every day, now goddess of fortune comes in a disguise and she cheats me also. <laughs> so that's like, so, but he is so touched. That, that's the first Rakshabandhan that we see. And he grants, and so goddess of Lakshmi is able to take back her husband to Vaikuntha, where he appears in his forearm form. When people hear these pastimes, you know, especially the pastime of uh, disappearance of the Yadu dynasty, people get bewildered sometimes. People say, oh, we are, you know, Lord Krishna was just like a common man. That is his magnanimity, that to attract us, he appears like that. He shows his spiritual world to us on this planet Earth. So we, Srila Prabhupada said that, our planet is very glorious and very fortunate that Lord Krishna decided he could have appeared in any planet, on any planet. There are many earthly planets. Yet at the same time, he decided to appear on our planet. And of our planet, he had decided to appear in Bharatvash. And among the Bharatvash, he decided to appear in Vrindavan Shetra, Vraj, Vraj Shetra, where he manifested Vrindavan, Golok Vrindavan, the supreme spiritual world. So yes, Golok Vrindavan is in spiritual world, but it's manifested here. So simultaneously, Lord can do that. There is a wonderful pastime of Sham Sundar, you know, one of Lord's amazing devotees, who was able to see the spiritual world and was able to interact with Radharani. There is a beautiful pastime that even in uh, Vrindavan that we see today, there are actually two Vrindavan pastimes are simultaneously going on. One is Bhauma Vrindavan, which is, you know, the material world's Vrindavan as we see it. And then there is spiritual Vrindavan. So Sham Sundar, he would just clean up, you know, and he was a devotee of Lord living in Vrindavan, so he would clean up the temple premises and so forth. And once he finds anklets, beautiful anklets. So he decides that, okay, whoever has these anklets, they were so beautiful and so precious, they would definitely come looking for it. So a young maiden, she comes looking for these anklets. She says, have you found any anklet? Because my sister, uh, my friend, she lost her anklets. So Sham Sundar says that, oh, I did find it, but I will give it only to the owner. And now the ma young maiden, she is puzzled. So then she returns by saying, yes, my friend has agreed to meet you. And then he's taken and suddenly he sees the spiritual Vindavan manifesting and he gets to see Radharani along with her Sakis, Ashta Sakis and the Manjaris. And when he sees them, he realizes that he's in the spiritual world. And he, you know, is given the form of a Manjari and then a marking on his forehead, like a straight line with a dot underneath, under it, is being placed by Radharani herself. And in the spiritual world, when he comes back to this palm of Vrindavan, he again sees himself as he was, right, with a man's body. Yet at the same time, that marking was on his forehead. And his god brothers, they came and they said, what is this marking? Why is the head? He tells them about this past time. And they th Tell him that it must just be a dream. When nobody is able to remove the marking, that marking is permanently on his forehead. So Lord, when he touches our heart, he touches it permanently. So he's residing in our heart. We have to have the eyes to be able to see the Lord. Now this past him as Krishna Surya Sama is also very important. Lord Krishna is absolute truth, right? And we understand that absolute truth does not change. His body is not different from his mind and his soul and everything is same. So it's not a relative aspect like uh, in our case, we have this material bodies, we have separate mind, intelligence, ego and so forth. And then we associate, we engage in different kind of activities at different times. So our body grows, so we take birth, we grow, we have children, then we dwindle and then we die. And so these, you know, we maintain ourselves for some time as well. So the six kind of changes, they constantly go on in this material world. Yet in the case of Lord Krishna, that is not there. 
Yet at the same time, we see in Vrindavan that Lord Krishna is growing, right? He's growing from, you know, from an infant to toddler to young boy, Pandrika age and so, uh, you know, onward, Kumar age and so forth. And then in Mathura and Dwarka, he always looks the same youthful personality. Now, how do we understand this? So we can understand this with reference to the analogy given by sun, Krishna Suri Sama. Just like sun rises, right? Similarly, Lord is performing past, his pastime. So on one planet, he is one year old. In another planet, he is two year old. So this is a spiritual realm, a spiritual planet. So just like when we see the sun, we are able to see, yes, he is in the sky. So similarly, when lords, that one-year-old pastimes are to be there, they become manifest in Vrindavan. And devotees can see, you know, all the personalities. At that time could see that Lord performing. So yes, just like sun we see. Similarly, Lord, even though he's in the spiritual world, that spiritual world is manifested on the simultaneously, there and here. So again, Lord can perform amazing pastimes. So on earth, we see that Lord, he is one year old, two years old. And actually, they are different spiritual realms, spiritual worlds. They are passing through. And as he goes to the third year, another one is passing through, where Lord Krishna is eternally three years old. And similarly, as the time is passing, they are passing through. And as the third year one comes to second year one, you know, spiritual world passes across and third year becomes manifest to us. When third year goes away, fourth year manifests to us. So Lord has this perfect arrangement that when he's performing his pastimes, especially from Dwarka perspective, Lord is performing amazing pastimes in Dwarka. The topmost pastimes are in Vrindavan. Then comes Dwarka, then comes Mathura. But in Mathura and Dwarka, it is Vasudev Krishna who's performing these pastimes. And he is eternally the same. So when he is deciding to leave, when he has come with a great procession with all the other Vishnu Tattvas, all his portions and planet portions and his eternal associates, he won't leave alone. So he will leave with them. And that leaving, Acharyas explained, is the burden of love. He wants his eternal associates to go with him. Now also, when Lord Brahma had prayed and as she is Sagar, Lord Vishnu had said that, yes, I will appear and ask the demigods to take birth in the Yadu dynasties. So in the family of Yadavas who were there on the planet Earth, so that they would become my associates and they would help me in annihilating these demons. So many demigods, they took birth. So these demigods who had taken birth, they were also in Dwarka as Lord's associates. And some of them, so again Acharyas explains, Srila Vishwana Chakradi Thakur explains, and in the purport also it's very nicely explained, that some of these demigods, they had the same potency as Lord Shri Krishna. Because when a child appears, the child has the backing of all the strength of his father. So similarly, when these demigods are appearing in Yadu dynasty, they have all these potencies and do by Lord Krishna. So they have beautiful form, they are very powerful, they are magnanimous, they are very religious, they are following the, you know, and respecting Brahmanical culture. So they are surrendered constantly. They were thinking about Lord Krishna, they were hearing about Lord Krishna's pastimes and they were constantly glorifying Lord Krishna. So Lord Krishna was their life and soul as eternal associates. They were, in this particular case, the demigods were like that. However, there were some demigods because they are at the same level and familiarity breeds contempt. It is a common saying in English. So because they were appearing in the same family as Lord Krishna and they were showing the same prowess as Lord Krishna and they were enjoying the same, you know, luxuries as Lord Krishna. So some of them, these demigods, became inimical to Lord Krishna. So they disregarded Lord Krishna. They would not even respect his will. They would act, you know, as they felt like. Now, it is also said that because of the effect of Yogamaya, this was induced as well. 
Yet there is that minute freedom we have as living entities. Lord is Bhagavad Janadana, so he is looking for our love. Yet at the same time, when so much potency is given to us by the Lordship, sometimes we get bewildered. So that has been also narrated again and again in Srimad Bhagavatam. Just like Sastra Arjun, he was given thousand arms and he became proud because of that. So even though he was righteous king, because of that pride that came in him, he, you know, offended the Brahmanas, especially father of Parshura, Jamatagni. And that's where it was the cause of his death. So sometimes when we get more than what we can carry on our shoulder, it causes us to become proud and then we cannot approach Lord Krishna. So Queen Kunti in her prayers, she is singing that Lord, one who has high birth, one who has all kind of opulences, one who is very highly educated, one who is very powerful, one who is very beautiful. And because of these great you know, qualities that one has received by your mercy, one may become proud. And when one becomes proud, they cannot approach with the right mood. In the mood of surrender. They cannot approach with the mood of love. They cannot approach with the mood of gratitude. They cannot be tolerant to other living entities. Not realizing that all other living entities are also your sons and daughters. So, Lord Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Mame Vamsho Jeeva Loke Jeeva Bhuta Sanatana. Said all the living entities are my part and parcel. And they are eternal beings, Sanatana. Sanatana means eternal being. So we also call Vishnu Dharma as Sanatana Dharma. Sanatana Dharma is eternal religion because it is the religion of the eternal living entity, us, as the soul, as the jivas. So that is the most important dharma. Then next comes, secondary is the dharma of the body because of the influence of the three modes of material nature based on what is us, you know, position, what is our nature, and we engage in various prescribed duties as per our nature associated with the body. Yet, it has to be dovetailed in following Sanatana Dharma. So that is the true meaning, as we understand. So Lord Krishna, he is showing with his pastime that it is the burden of love that he wants to release, relieve from earth. What had happened that these demigods who had become inimical, they have to be destroyed and sent back to the demigod planets. The eternal associates of the Lord and the devotees of the Lord, and many of them, again, Acharya has explained, had become fully devoted to Lord Krishna. And that secret has also been revealed by Srila Vishwana Chakwati Thakur. Beautiful narrations where he is saying that when these devotees, the demigods, some of the demigods, when they took birth, they were so surrendered to Lord Krishna. And there are three stages a devotee passes through. So they were passing through this final stage. So first stage is, one gets, you know, attraction to Lord Krishna by hearing about his name, form, activities, pastimes. So the more we hear about the supreme pastimes of Lord Shri Krishna, we become attracted to him. And so we start engaging in devotional service. And that is also because of prayer that we constantly are meditating on and praying to the Lordship. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So when we are constantly praying to the Lordship to please engage us, in his devotional service, engage us in serving him for his pleasure. And we are praying through Radharani because mother is more compassionate than father. So we are actually going through the right media through Radharani. Mother Radhe, please engage us in your service and service of our father, Lord Krishna, Lord Rama. So with this mood as we are engaging, you know, praying, one becomes, you know, engage and so the next stage that happens is devotional service and when one is engaged in devotional service after many many births sometimes it's said and for sincere devotee within the same life once Srila Prabhupada was asked this question how long does it take for one to become Krishna conscious Srila Prabhupada said it can be instantly all you have to do is surrender everything and you know 
follow Krishna, follow his instructions. You know, devote your heart and yourself fully in that mode. So instantly you can become Krishna conscious. And the devotees, when they heard, they were like, wow, surprise, this is so easy, they were thinking. That all you have to do. And when they further wanted to know, then Srila Prabhupada gives this reference from Bhagavad Gita. Sarva dharmam pratyajya maam ekam sharanam raja aham tvam sarva pape bhyo mokshya shashmi maashucha. Give up all varieties of religion, sarva dharmam pratyajya. Maam ekam sharanam raja. Only take my shelter. So not you take shelter of maya and then also take my shelter. No, take only my shelter, Lord Krishna is saying. So completely detach yourself from all and just attach Build attachment to the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. Aham tuam sarva papipyo. I will deliver you from all reactions of your activities. Right? So all sinful reactions that were there, they will all be removed. Mashucha. Do not fear. Do not doubt. Do not have any tinge of doubt in this respect. You don't have to worry about it. So he is revealing this great secret to us, his blessing. So devotees who take this message to their heart, they engage in devotional service. And by engaging in devotional service, our existence is purified. We become more and more purified and we understand that our eternal religion, Sanatana Dharma is to be an eternal servant of Lord Krishna. Jivera Surupoya Krishnera Nitya Das, we are eternal servant of Lord Krishna. And when we serve Lord Krishna, with love, when we serve Lord Krishna, with devotion, when we serve Lord Krishna to please Him, not expecting anything in return, just to reflect our gratitude in His service. When we engage in devotional service in the association of devotees, doing it with patience, with love, with determination, with enthusiasm, following in the footsteps of Acharyas, following the instructions of Acharyas in disciplic succession, following the nine processes of devotional service. When we search in this manner exchange, we come to the next level. And Acharya explained that the next level is where Lord Krishna allows us to, uh, you know, participate in one of his pastimes. So when he is performing his pastime in a material universe, he is manifesting his spiritual world. He allows us the entry, the first entry is in the spiritual world because they, where there is Krishna, it is spiritual world. Yet, at the same time, it is an activity in one of the material universes. So many of the demigods who had come to the second stage, they also appeared and they were fully surrendered at the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. One point, so Akrur, you know, he was a worshipper of sun god and after being at Sun Planet, after some time as a demigod, he took birth and he appeared as a Krur and he was a close associate of Lord Krishna. So he, instead of going back, he attains perfection by praying, right? Just by reciting prayers to the Lordship, he attains perfection and he becomes an eternal associate of Lord Krishna and he goes back to the spiritual world. He goes back to the spiritual Dwarka. So, in this particular chapter, how that is happening and the secret behind, you know, the annihilation of the other dynasty has been identified. Sometimes people, because Lord Krishna makes it only visible to the devotees that to understand the reason. So, the, there are three reasons. First reason is, he wanted to deliver the burden of earth. Second is, he wanted to deliver the burden of love to send his eternal associates back to their destination, to the spiritual world. His Vishnu form back to their Vish Vishnu Vakunta planets and his other associates back to where they belong. So the ones who were inimical to Lord Krishna, the demigods who had appeared and they thought that Lord Krishna is at the same level and they could not respect him. That he's the supreme personality of God. That he's so magnanimous. He's showing by his example that whatever is mine is yours. So that's the mood of an affectionate father. Affectionate father gives everything to his son. Yet at the same time, if the son doesn't respect, then they cannot become the rightful son. 
So here, we always talk about bona fide spiritual master, bona fide spiritual master. We also have to understand that there is a concept of bona fide disciple also. So yes, a spiritual master appears in disciplic succession and as a bona fide spiritual master engages us in devotional service. Yet at the same time, we as bona fide disciple is that when we follow the regulative principles, when we engage in devotional service, when we promote the mood of our spiritual master. So there are three levels of devotees. One is, first disciple is, without being heard from a spiritual master, understands what spiritual master wants and engages himself or herself in carrying out those instructions of spiritual master to please the spiritual master without expecting any return. Second one is the one who has to be told what to do. So the spiritual master has to tell the second class disciple that do this. And then he does that. And he needs constant guidance throughout the process. If he's not able to do it, he takes shelter of spiritual master and reports, I'm trying to do it, but this is my state. So the spiritual master provides constant guidance. So the second one requires a lot more work, right? He has not come to the level that he understands the mood of his spiritual master and carries out those activities. The third one is, the spiritual master keeps saying, but he never does. And sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. So he's very flickering. He's at a neophyte state, you know, in the beginning state. So we have to be, you know, we have to rise ourselves to that first class disciple, the bona fide disciple level, where we should understand the message of our spiritual master, the instructions of our spiritual master, so that we can serve him by carrying out his instructions. Srila Prabhupada exemplifies this. He never received this instruction directly that go to West. Yes, Bhakti Siddhan Saraswati Goswami Maharaj told the very first time he met Srila Prabhupada that you are a very you know, nice gentleman, you know English, so why don't you spread this message of Godhead in English in, you know, so that the Western world can understand. So Srila Prabhupada took that to his heart. Srila Bhakti Siddhan Saraswati Goswami Maharaj Prabhupada, he had sent twice his disciples to the Western world. But they were not successful, they came back and they were just saying, everyone in the Western world is eating meat and fish and abominable things and we are not able to, they are asking such you know, vain questions that we are not able to answer. And Srila Prabhupada, when he heard that, he was like, what is a question that cannot be answered from Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita and Chaitamita? These scriptures are full of potency that any question somebody has can easily be answered. And so he came, carrying in his heart the instructions of his spiritual master, Srila Bhakti Siddhan Saraswati Goswami Maharaj Prabhupada. And so he carried it out. And any time anybody glorified Srila Prabhupada, he said, no, it is by the mercy of my Guru Maharaj. And he glorified his spiritual master. And that is a qualification. This is where we learn from him. How he's showing us how to be a bona fide disciple. That whatever we get is by the mercy of our spiritual master. Kona bhagyavana jiva guru krishna prasada paya bhakti lata vija. Brahmar bhramite. So we had been wandering in this material world up and down like in a ferris wheel. Right? Kona bhagyavana jiva. A fortunate soul. By the mercy of Krishna gets the spiritual master and by the mercy of spiritual master gets the seed of devotion. That is sowed in the heart and is watered by the chanting of the holy name so that it sprouts and this bhakti lata the creeper of this devotion crosses over the material universes and rests at the lotus feet of lord krishna in golok vindavan so this watering process is very important my dear friends my dear devotees that we have to constantly engage in watering by calling out for the lordship Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. So here, burden of earth, burden of love. Now what is the third time? To reestablish his plenary Vishnu expansions in their abodes, such as Vakunta, Shweta Dweep and Badrikashram. So yes, he is sending his associates. But he also has to send his Vishnu Tattvas, his other po his portions and planetary portions to their individual abodes. So they can carry out their activities. So in Bhadrikasham, Nanar and Rishya are there. 
So that Nar represents like it's an expansion of Nar is Arjun, and Narayan is an expansion of Lord Krishna. So these rishis are there. And why are we discussing the nine rishis uh, in this particular chapter in eleventh canto? It's because Lord is going to give Uddhav, you know, from seven to twenty-nine chapters, Uddhav Gita. He's actually saying that I'm going to give you a message for that you have to take to Nar Narayan Rishi in Badrikashan. And Uddhav says, Okay, I'll take the message. Now the, when the when Lord Krishna is revealing the message, it's very important for the messenger to understand the message because if he goes to the destination and delivers the message, the person at the end asks, what's the message? If you cannot explain, then you have lost the purpose, right? Reminds me of a very nice story Srila Prabhupada used to narrate where a friend, when he used to write to his other friend, in the, a man used to write to his friend in the city, his friend writes him back that next time you send me a letter, you should send a return ticket. So he asks why. So in, a, in the letter he reveals that actually to be able to read your letter, because your handwriting is so bad, in able to read your letter, I have to travel by train to your place, come to you and ask you to read your letter, and then I have to come back to my place as well. So that is just to, you know, in a funny manner, Srila Prabhupada is revealing that it is very important that a messenger, when he takes the message, the message should be, understood well so that at the destination you know you can enable the person to understand what the message is and in old times we see in the village in the villages people were not literate so the postman would come and they would say can you read the letter for us and explain it what is it all about and the postman would open the letter and carry out and read the message as it is and why did i say as it is because that is the essence everyone who appears all personalities in disciplic succession as devotees, we are actually postmen. We are carrying the message of Lord Krishna as it is. That's why Srila Prabhupada called his Bhagavad Gita as it is. Because he wanted to provide the message as Lord Krishna intended. So that is an essence. So here those three purposes have been clearly identified. Yet at the same time there is people who are not devoted to Lord Krishna. To their eyes Everything is appearing like Lord Krishna is appearing like a common man. He is not the king of Dwarka because King Ugrasan is the king of Dwarka. He is just one of the Yadavas. That's how they are looking at Lord Krishna. And so he, means Lord Krishna is so magnanimous, he is showing himself that he is just one of the Yadavas. Just like sometimes people would ask Srila Prabhupada, that so you are Skon? And he would say, no, actually I am a member of Skon. That's his magnanimity. Even though he is the founder of Acharya, he is the preeminent Shiksha Guru of Iskon, International Society for Krishna Consciousness, he would show with his own example, he would exemplify to us how he would take an humble position. He could have very well said, I am the founder of Acharya. But every time he took this humble position, that made him exalted in the eyes of his disciples and the devotees all around the world. And they would jump when they would see Srila Prabhupada. They would jump with joy. They would dance and they would serve him. They would worship him as a disciple is to worship his spiritual master. And they would feel that Srila Prabhupada is carrying Vaikuntha because he was carrying the mood of Vaikuntha. So Lord Krishna was present with Srila Prabhupada every time he, wherever he was going. Srila Bhakti Siddhan Saraswati Maharaj was traveling with Srila Prabhupada wherever he was going. So when Srila Prabhupada went to Mayapur, His Holiness Bhakti Charu Maharaj discusses in this book, he directly went, you know, he engaged on this project at Mayapur for his con, and he did not visit Srila Bhakti Siddhan Saraswati Maharaj's Samadhi. So many of the, you know, Gaudiya Sampradaya, uh, many of his god brothers and other devotees in Gaudiya Sampradaya, they were you know, criticizing him. And when some of the devotees heard, they revealed it to him that they are criticizing. Srila Prabhupada said, why should I visit his Samadhi? I never felt separation from my Guru Maharaj. I always have been following his instructions. I am always feeling the presence of my Guru Maharaj. I have never forgotten my Guru Maharaj. He is with me at every step. I am paraphrasing some of this aspect just to, you know, understand, make everyone understand the messages amazing. The message is a message of love as how Srila Prabhupada 
All he was doing was to please his spiritual master. So that's the mood of a bona fide disciple that he is showing to us. And Srila Prabhupada also carried out every single activity with so much detail, with so much attention, with so much care. His Grace uh, Ravindra Saru Prabhu, he discusses that when Srila Prabhupada, he was getting ready to take bath, he was in Gamcha and all the GBC men were standing, you know, sitting in the room and they were having this heavy conversation going on. And Srila Prabhupada wanted to hand over a check to um, His Grace Ravindra Saru Prabhu to uh, be, you know, deposited in the bank. And in the middle of all this conversation, when he called, you know, His Grace Ravindra Saru Prabhu and Prabhu came, he handed over the check, gave him clear instructions, focusing one on one. And, you know, Ramiswa Prabhu, he says that I had never received so clear instructions. And after receiving the instructions, he made sure that I understood it well. So that is acknowledgement, not just you're passing on the message, not knowing whether the person got the message or not, making sure that he has understood. Then he left, and Prabhupada, as if nothing happened, he was again engaging in the conversations with his GBC man. So this is amazing that every single detail that we do, we have to focus on that activity. So if you want to learn customer service, if you want to learn paying attention to other associates, other devotees around us, advanced devotees, our friend devotees on the same level, and you know the devotees who are bringing on, you know, taking on Krishna consciousness and have not advanced so well, being compassionate towards them. So again, according to different levels, we are engaged in loving exchanges on a daily basis. So that has been exemplified here by Lord Krishna himself because he did not appear as king of Dwarka. He appeared as a resident of Dwarka. While the whole Dwarka city was brought on this planet Earth by Lord Krishna, it was created, it was manifested by Lord Krishna, yet he was more than willing to share it with all his associates his eternal associates with the demigods who took birth in the dynasty of Yadavas and all his wonderful devotees. Sometimes when a common person thinks from this view who is not a devotee, he, again Srila Prabhupada also in his uh, purports have explained this aspect. And uh, Shukdev Goswami is narrating that a person thinks that the sky is cloudy just because the clouds are carried in the sky. But no, they are not, the sky is not cloudy, it's the clouds that are, you know, being carried by the wind in the air. And sometimes when there is dust, soil, you know, in the air, they call the air is muddy. Well, air is never muddy, it is the mud in the air that's making it look so. So similarly, the soul is aloof. Similarly, Lord's spiritual world is aloof from this material world. And how do you differentiate material world? A place which is also referred to as Mathunagra, you know, place where one is always seeking sex and enjoyment and that is supposed to be said to be the main cause of our repeated birth, death, old age, disease, constant birth and death, the cycle of birth and death that goes on. And also palatable, so our tongue is very strong. So we also want to taste palatable things. But Simple solution was given, revealed by Srila Prabhupada to His Holiness Bhakti Charu Maharaj that if you want to control your tongue, tongue wants to engage in all kind of gossip, tongue wants to engage all kind in eating all kind of palatable things. Eat Krishna Prasad and, she, and His Holiness Bhakti Charu Maharaj. Maharaj, he shares in his book, Ocean of Mercy, he says that when I went to Mayapur and I was given this Maha, I never tasted such delicious food in my life. Can you imagine? He himself used to cook amazing food that all his friends would come when he was in Germany and he had to invite them one or two at a time, you know, when he would cook for them and they would relish his food. And he himself is saying that he had never tasted when he had tasted this Mahaprasad that was offered to Lord Krishna, the Bhoga offering afterwards, the remnants. Prasad also called, known as mercy. So he's experiencing the mercy of Lord Krishna when he's tasting Mahaprasad because it is non different. It has been touched by Krishna, so it is Krishnaized. Here, such personalities, they are 
you know, when they are not devotees of Lord Krishna, they are not bewildered. So not to bewilder the mind of any kind. Whoever comes with whatever mindset, Lord Krishna wants to satisfy them. If you think he is not Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna makes it appear his past time as if, you know, he is not Supreme Personality of Godhead. That's why when we go to the temple, people who are just going, you know, sometimes we see workers and they're like saying, uh, can we move these uh, statues on the altar because we have to do such and such work? We realize that they are seeing them as idols. And that's okay because that's the vision they have. So Lord appears as idols to them. For a devotee who knows that he's the Supreme Personality of God, and Lord appears as, you know, Supreme Personality of God. He manifests his deity form to the eye. So his Bhav Garijanardana, as beauty is in the eye of beholder. So as we see Lord, he manifests to us. Yet at the same time, the same people who are not surrendered to Lord Krishna, sometimes they become very proud. Just like the demigods who are considering Lord Krishna on the equal level and thinking that why should we have to follow Lord Krishna, right? We are as powerful as he is. So he is not the Supreme Personality of God and he's just like one of us. So sometimes when, they, when people behave in this manner, so they get similar examples and they miss out the beautiful essence. So this is, has been exemplified with an story, a very nice story. Once there was a baby camel, goes to its mother and says, Oh my dear mother, why do we have this hump on our back? Mother says, Oh, this, very proudly she say, this is where we store the water. So we have to be in desert, in desert we have to survive without water for 20, 30 days. So we use the water stored in our hump to nourish our thirst. So our baby is like, wow, I didn't know that. Then he says, and why do we have these long legs, you know? Or then she is again very proud to say, oh, we have these long legs because we are also called the ship of the desert. We can run very fast in desert. We can travel great distance in desert very nicely. And he says, but why do we have this? Our footprints are so round, you know, at the bottom. Uh, she, she says, this is to really create that balance when we run. We don't want to you know, lose our balance and fall down. So to be able to manage our balance very nice, our legs, you know, footprints are so round and small so that we can carry it out very nicely. And then he says, oh mother, these eyelashes, they disturb me a lot. Why do we have these long eyelashes? At that time, mother camel, being very proud of all these features, she is saying, oh, this is because when there is sandstorm in the desert, the sand blows and it can get into our eyes, but these lashes, they eyelashes they protect us so we close our eyelashes and the sand cannot you know get into our eyes so we are protected so now the baby camera is saying mother this is all very nice and then if we have all these capabilities what are we doing in the zoo right so the similar question we should ask if we are also Satchidananda, we are also eternal being Sanatan we are also Chit full of knowledge and we are full of transcendental bliss. What are we doing in this material world? And so if we are spiritual beings, we can have a spiritual experience. The choice is ours. This is also very important to understand. When we engage in devotional service, we are having a spiritual experience. And that is where we get happiness. Otherwise, we will be wandering in desert, running, chasing this mirage, so this earth, this Material world is like a desert. We are, we are constantly changing mirage after mirage, accomplishments after accomplishment. But that void in the heart is always void. And all we have to do is take shelter of Lord Krishna to understand in disciplic succession the truth about his appearance and his pastimes. When we understand this truth, then we don't have to take another birth in this material world. A great blessing has been revealed in this chapter. Now, Lord Krishna is deciding that he is going to take all his associates. Now, how does that happen has also been revealed in this chapter. So, as we heard, just like sun, at the rising time, all the sky becomes red. So, at the time of setting also, the sky has all these colors. So, sometimes people say, oh, look at the sky. It is so beautiful. It has all these amazing colors. Not realizing that actually <coughs> it is the sunlight when it's passing through, it's creating those colors. Sky doesn't have those colors. It is the sunlight when it's coming with, you know, with the setting and the rising of the sun. It's creating that spread of colors 
because of the spectrum that gets split because of the long distance. So that's how it's appearing. And right after Lord Krishna leaves, so Acharya is there explaining. So again, we'll discuss about the past events, why, how this curse manifest. But we talked about a curse that was given earlier prior to this curse by Gandhari. So that's in Mahabharat. That all your descendants, all of the Yadu dynasty will be annihilated just like my sons are killed. So that was the one that Lord Krishna accepted. And when Lord Krishna would leave, there will be darkness all around, right? So where would we get the light? And that is the question that the sages at Namasharanya are discussing. That is the secret that Shukdev Goswami is revealing to Parikshit Maharaj. So that has been revealed in the Shastras that in this age of Kali, when there is darkness everywhere, how does, what kind of sun can we take shelter of? So there's a beautiful verse that comes in Srimad Bhagavatam in the third chapter of first canto. Krishna Swadhamo Padyate Dharma Jnana Dibisaha Kalonashtam Drisham Mesha Puranako Adhunodita. So after Lord Krishna returned to his special abode, Dharma Jnana Dibisaha, with religion, Dharma, Jnana, knowledge, and others, so other great personalities. When Lord Krishna you know, went back, so when he finished his pastime, when the sun is setting, so as sun sets and now doesn't become visible to our eyes, similarly, the manifestation of Lord's spiritual abode on our, in our material universe is not there anymore. He has passed on to the next universe. There is darkness. Right after sunset, there is for some time little light, but then after some time, there is darkness. So in this darkness, what will give the shelter? So here it is being revealed that it is Srila Vyasdev. He has brought to life Srimad Bhagavatam, which is like a rising sun, to deliver the living entities in this Kali age. So this Srimad Bhagavatam is the rising sun. This is non-different from Krishna. Also, Krishna is so merciful, he appears in his deity form. And he is so merciful that he has put all his potencies in his holy name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. So Lord Krishna and his name are the same, so they are not different. So such amazing blessings are there that we can take shelter of in these times. So for devotees there is no darkness. We are in rising sun. And whoever wants to come in the light of this rising sun would have to at least make this effort to get up from the dark room that they are sitting in, come out in this bright sun by studying Srimad Bhagavatam, by chanting the holy name, by going to the temple and worshipping the deities, understanding that Supreme Personality of Godhead is so merciful that he takes a form so that we can relish him, his sweet pastime. And when we chant holy name, he's dancing on our tongue. So such is the blessing and this is Srila Vyasdev by his mercy. And then by the mercy of Srila Prabhupada, this Srimad Bhagavatam, which is Amal Purana, faultless, is the sweetest fruit, right? Just like the, you know, mango from the tree. It's very ripened when it has been bitten by Shukha by a parrot. Similarly, it's coming out from the lips of Shukdev Goswami, so it has become more nectarian. And it is very important for us, to, for us to understand that this blessing is there, the sun is here, all we have to do is take shelter. Yet at the same time, Srila Prabhupada, he also warns us that nothing should be changed. So he has already introduced the whole program. And when he was present, he was constantly feeling this distress that his disciples and the devotees, they would try to introduce new, new things. Like Krishna Ball was introduced at uh, Dallas, Gurukul, and similar, those various things were being introduced. Now this TED talk is really taking up all of devotees' times and they are trying to, you know, even go in that direction. 
without realizing that everything has been given in Srimad Bhagavatam. Shukdev Goswami is constantly reciting Srimad Bhagavatam, teaching us with his 18,000 verses in Srimad Bhagavatam, the Sutta Goswami and Shukdev Goswami and all the wonderful devotees of the Lordships, how to really share the message of Godhead. Yet at the same time, you know, people get distracted and that's, Srila Prabhupada called it material disease disease of the western world at times and so many other words being, were being used but what's the more important is that we have to understand the process has been laid out by the acharyas and it has been revealed in bhakti rasam sindhu by Srila rupa goswami shuti smriti puranadi panch ratra vidham vina akantiki harer bhaktir utpat yeva kalpate so if we want to demonstrate with great devotion, engagement, and you know, services, then we have to follow the Shastras. Shruti is the Vedas, Smriti is the Puranas, then Purana Adi, and then Panchuratraka. Panchuratraka Vidhi is, again, this is a scripture where we learn how to serve the deities, how to engage in devotional service, you know, Bhajan Kriya, and how these have to be followed. Otherwise, it is very easy to become distracted and become speculative and go astray from our real path of devotional service. And when we are on our journey, you understand, when, when we are driving to our journey, at times it happens that we miss out a turn. That means to get back on track is such a long path. And we have to make a sincere effort to get back on track. And if we go on the wrong path, then we go to the wrong destination, right? If we realize from here we're going to travel and our destination will reach in eight hours, but somewhere we took the wrong turn and we never paid attention. You know, if it said, okay, you're supposed to be taking a left turn and we missed that left turn and we continue to go straight. And then afterwards it says, okay, take the right turn and we took the right turn, but we never for we forgot to take the left turn before, which was important. So now we could be traveling for eight hours, but we will not reach our destination. Similarly, when we follow, you know, the process, then we have to be very careful to follow the injunctions of the Shastras and the nice program that has already been laid out by Srila Prabhupada. Yet at the same time, we see this program has constantly, you know, changed. Yes, it's important to change details based on the circumstances, but we should not change the principle. And Srila Prabhupada, he exemplified so many times how the principle is being laid out in the program itself. Yet at the same time, when we have deviation, it causes reactions to come to us. And then sometimes devotees, we get bewildered. So at that time, it actually is a warning sign coming to us, making us realize that this warning is showing us that there is some deviation, right? And we should look, we should introspect, we should retrospect as devotees, looking at our back, like what have we done? and how can we fix what we are doing so that our movement forward is in the right direction with the right mindset with the right knowledge with the right awareness with the right consciousness to be very much cognizant of our surroundings and of our spiritual progress and together in the devotee association we have to help each other achieve that so it just so happened now comes the past time where the curse has been spoken so it so happened that uh, the sages, Devashi Narad, Vishwamitra, Kashyapamuni, many other great sages were there. They were engaging in performing a yajna. And afterward, Devashi Narad, he gave instructions to Vasudev, father of Lord Vasudev Krishna. And this is where the second through fifth chapter, those four chapters are discussed where after the yajyas, when Devashi Narad gives these instructions to Vasudev, and he is giving the instructions by narrating a pastime by, of Navyogindras, uh, who met Maharaj Nimi. And afterwards, on the instruction of Lord Krishna, they went to Pindaraka. It's a holy place two miles off of the coast of Gujarat and it's still called Pindaraka. So this place is still known by the same name. So they were at Pindaraka, these sages, and the young Yadava boys. Now it's very interesting, they're called young Yadava boys. Yet at the same time, Pradyumna is father of Anirudh. So these are not young, but they appeared young, eternally young, right? 
so they were in the mood of joking and this is another leela of lord krishna he is making all this happen to teach an example for us set an example for us that when sometimes we have all these opulences and all these nice facilities we become proud and we disregard we, we commit janapraad as if nothing is happening even you know committing offense towards a living entity is a bad thing even though there is some concession given in this kali age that you know an offense carried out in mind is not bearing reaction but why even have that we should make an effort why to even have that curb it right at its you know name it at its very root as soon as it comes because we are supposed to be engaging in devotional service we are supposed to be looking at welfare of all our brothers and sisters all living entities so we have to have that right mood and we should not act as diseased because then we have to pay a lot of attention on ourselves charity begins at home so first we have to make sure that we are spiritually strong before we go out to preach to others so that is a very important lesson for us so here just like a you know mother in law you know when she has a newly wedded a uh, daughter in law in her home and a do- her daughter in law she makes a mistake and mother in law wants to teach her daughter in law to correct her mistake but instead of saying that to daughter in law she chastises her daughter right and the daughter may be wondering what did i do yet at the same time daughter in law understands that this is something that is wrong and mother in law doesn't like it but she is not being so merciful to me she is not chastising me she is chastising her daughter and the daughter also understands that i am so dear to my mother that i will take this chastisement even if it is not done by me because i don't want to oppose her because of the loving relationship so sometimes it's better to be compassionate than being right so here in this way mother in law teaches her daughter in law what is right or wrong so similarly with this past time of this cursing lord krishna is teaching us people who you know living entities who took birth much later that we will see this kind of occurrence again and again in this material world and we have to take it with the right perspective and there are various examples given from chetanya mahaprabhu's times examples given from you know shila prabhupad's own time and so forth so we'll discuss some of those times so here what happens is that these young boys they wanted to you know have a prank and so they decided that they would have this prank so they uh, dressed up samba in the garb of a woman and what kind of woman a pregnant woman and they presented her with covering her face to the sages saying that this lady she is very anxious to know whether she will be a son or a daughter she is looking for a son she is expecting that she would have a son but could you please tell if she is going to have a son or a daughter so the sages they became angry and they cursed so devashinara he says that she would be a club and that would be the reason for the destruction of your whole dynasty and when these boys they heard this they were so shocked they were so shocked that when they heard this curse that the whole yadav dynasty would be annihilated they immediately removed the cloth and they saw that yes there was a club and so they took this club to king ugrasen so and they presented in the assembly to king ugrasen narrating the whole incident and all their lust of their body was lost and they were you know lamenting this act of theirs and this has all been arranged by lord krishna so he is making his associates go in this manner one of the important thing that's discussed here is that the four defects of the condition soul which is the tendency to be to cheat others which tendency to uh, you know commit mistakes uh, imperfect senses and to be delish, deluded so those four defects are not there in pure souls so in the pure devotees of lord krishna these defects are not there and so the sages being the pure devotees of lord krishna they did not show any of these signs rather a devotee of lord krishna he is safe from such circumstances 
and brahmanas they sometimes become angry when somebody is you know making joke or making fun of brahmanic culture and of brahmanas because brahmanas are the spiritual masters so spiritual master guru also means heavy so they have to be grave and heavy in making sure that people understand the position of devotion a devotional service it is the topmost uh, gift that we have received in this material world that can help us cross over this ocean of nascence bhav sagar so now this has been this past time has been narrated very nicely so this is here we see devashi narad and other sages at pindarak you know responding to the young boys and this is where we see you know pradyumna samba and others they are presenting the club and narrating the whole incident to king ugrasen now one of the interesting thing that acharya has revealed here is that when the boys they returned they did not discuss it with lord krishna because they were so ashamed for their actions right for these activities that they tried to mock the pure devotees of the lordship so because lord krishna would chastise them immediately so to save themselves from chastisement they did not discuss it with lord krishna and lord krishna is causing all this past time so he is like okay so be it continue continue and then they went to king ugrasen and they presented the situation to king ugrasen so king ugrasen and all the yadavas in the assembly hall they started lamenting and they started wanting as what to do and king ugrasen you know they were all worried about this curse because this has been given by brahmanas and pure devotees of lord krishna vaishnava brahmanas and this is this cannot be you know turned back yet at the same time they are trying to find solution and king ugrasen does not discuss this with lord krishna also so in the assembly hall when this is presented lord krishna was not present so that has also been identified a similar past time where lord krishna was not consulted and was not present is the time where gambling match was arranged by duryodhan and he invites yudhishthir maharaj and the pandavas for this gambling match he challenges them and then this gambling match is happening and yudhishthir maharaj he doesn't invite lord krishna duryodhan is saying that from my side my uncle shakuni he will be throwing the dice but you this time maharaj had this opportunity but he does not invite lord krishna rather he was praying that oh lord krishna you don't be here otherwise what will you feel you know if you see your devotee like me engaging in such an abominable act because as kshatriya you cannot turn down this offer so he was engaged and he was praying that lord krishna so when uddhav asked this question that why didn't you go why didn't you help you this time maharaj when this gambling match was arranged then lord krishna reveals lord vasudev reveals to uddhav that it was actually yudhishthir maharaj who was constantly praying that oh lord please don't be here he didn't want me to be there so if he is wishing how can i go without his wish and he is wishing me not to be there and if shakuni is winning if yudhishthir maharaj would have invited me Do you think I would not get what Yudhishthir Maharaj wanted when I threw the dice? Of course I would, but he was praying that, "Oh Krishna, you please, you know, don't be here." So he lost. He got cheated. So when we don't consult God or His representative for our benefit, then we are at loss. That's the important message that we hear. So we every time we get bewildered, that we are in anxiety, we are in a situation we don't know what to do, like COVID nineteen pandemic is going on. Then we should take shelter of Lord's devotees. We should consult with advanced Vaishnavas, advanced you know devotees of the Lordship, to ask questions, to inquire from them. And that's why when we are you know discussing such wonderful pastimes, we request devotees online to please ask questions. so that we and other vaishnavas have an opportunity to respond to your questions make sure that you are getting proper guidance make sure that you are getting proper peace and happiness the formula of peace and happiness is there yet at the same time in such times people may become anxious because of various situations so please don't hesitate ask those questions because it is for your own benefit so here king ugrasen who was referred to as yaduraj the king of the yadus yadavas he decides that this club should be grounded 
into powder. So that has been taken care of. So it's grounded to powder and is thrown in the ocean. Now the waves bring the, the particles onto the shore. And also there was a lump. The remaining as they were grounding and there was a lump. So that was thrown as it is. And this lump was taken by a fish. So this fish was caught by the fishermen along with other fishes. And from his stomach, when this lump was discovered, Hunter Jara, you know, he gets that lump of iron. And he uses it to create the arrowhead of his arrow. At the end of his shaft, he creates the arrowhead. Now, who is this? Jara, Hunter. In Ramayan, he is Bali, the elder brother of Sugriv who was killed by Lord Ramchandra when Lord Ramchandra hiding behind a tree, he shoots the arrow, killing Bali. And Bali at that time when he was dying, he said that, my dear Lord, why couldn't you just approach me? And Lord Ramchandra reveals that actually you were ally of, you had alliance with Ravan and you were tormenting your, your younger brother. So again, there is a wonderful pastime around that. So here, that Lord Krishna arranges everything so nicely. Now this Hunter Jara would have the opportunity to nullify that reaction. So again, there was an action as said. So again, from material perspective, people who are looking at the karma cycle and who are not devotees, they're saying, oh, yeah, 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 this is, you know, there is action and reaction. So because Lord Ramchandra did this, now Krishna would have to pay for that reaction. It is Lord Krishna's pastime. He's above the three modes of material nature. He's above the karma cycle. But to bewilder non-devotees, he's performing his pastimes so amazingly that all variety of people who are listening to his pastimes are feeling satisfied in their heart. Yet at the same time, Lord Krishna is saying that one who knows the truth, tattvataha, of his appearance and his pastimes, will never take birth again, will not have to suffer in this material world again, will always be happy and be able to go back home, back to Godhead. And will always be blissful. So such wonderful are the blessings in this particular chapter. So this is where this chapter is ending. And what we hear is that Lord is delivering the burden of earth. The Lord is delivering the burden of love. His eternal associate, when he goes like a king, goes back on his procession, so he's going back. And he's establishing all his swamshas, the Vishnu Tattvas, you know, the ones in Bhadrikasham, in uh, Shir Sagar, Shirodakshay Vishnu and other Vishnu Tattvas, they are going back to their places as they're going on. Pradyumna, Niruddha, Vasudeva and Sankarshan, all of them are going to their spiritual abodes. So those three things have been taken care of. Lord is teaching us by his example that we should always be honoring the devotees, the Vaishnava Brahmanas, and we should be very respectful to them. We should not try to make joke. And this is for the fake devotees. You know, he's showing and the offenders of Vaishnavas that, you know, they have to go through severe punishment, even in the form of death, just like the curse results in the annihilation of all the dynasty of Yadavas. So all the Yadavas are annihilated. So that is something that happens near the end of the 11th canto. Yet at the same time, the curse has happened. And we know that the curse has been also accepted. So Lord Krishna, he accepts, he could have easily done this, you know, nullified it. But he uses it as a media, as time. So that's why he said, just like, you know, Lord Krishna, Lord Vasudev was staying as time personified at the home of Vasudev and Devaki, his parents. So he's allowing everything to go and take its course as time. So Lord Krishna says, time I am destroyer of all things in Bhagavad Gita. So he's making it manifest here. All these facts are being revealed. So we should be very respectful towards the Vaishnavas. And anytime we get bewildered, anytime we have anxiety, anytime we feel fear, we should take shelter of Vaishnavas. We should take shelter of spiritual masters. We should take shelter of devotees. We should inquire submissively, not in a challenging mode, but rather for our benefit we should inquire, not to test others' knowledge. That would be frivolous because it is not recommended in Shastras. Rather, we should be looking at what is the benefit I can derive with this association. Love Matra Sadhu Sangha Sarva Siddhi Haya. Shastras say that just by a momentary association of a devotee, one can attain all perfection. 
So this is where we would like to end this chapter today. Thank you very much for joining us today. Please join us for the Simhadevati. Hare Krishna. Shila Prabhupada ki jai, Anant Parivashan Vind ki jai, Shrimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Hare Krishna Mahamantra ki jai, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.